Welcome to this edition of When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine, a discussion of sustainable living and what that means to you and me. I'm Jay Warmke. And I'm Annie Warmke. You are certainly Annie Warmke. And today we're going to talk about getting into agritourism, or let me get this straight, they pay you to walk with your livestock. Nobody in the entire human race has that <laughs> accent. I just did. And certainly uh-huh. not the guy who well, actually the story said there, that. Yeah, but the story there was, okay, when we were first starting up Blue Rock Station, trying to figure out any way we could make some money, um, we decided to uh, do llama trekking, right? And so we had a few llamas, and people would pay us, and they— We'd halter them up and put a little pack, and we'd walk into the woods, and we'd we'd have a picnic and all of that. Well, the guy at the feed store, that's what he said to me. He's mm-hmm. like, let me get this straight. They pay you to walk with your lifestyle. And I was saying, well, we don't really market it that way. But um, Then yeah. he said, I've got some cows. Yeah, he's like, I've got a couple <laughs> of cows. You think those guys from the city would pay me to walk around with my cows? And I'm like, well, yeah, you never know. So basically, in a nutshell, that's agritourism, right? Well, it's an example of uh-huh. agritourism. All right. So, um, so walking what is? with cattle or, or llamas or whatever and yeah. look, looking at nature. Because we all know that if you've got a farm, it's, it's practically impossible to make money on it. Uh, the system is kind of set up against you. So agritourism is a popular way of saying, okay, I've got this resource. How can I actually make a living from okay, my well, that's the show. We don't have to talk there, about we're it. We're all done. Yeah. So okay. agritourism. Well, thank you for joining us. Yeah. <laughs> agritourism is really the marriage of tourism and agriculture in some form or fashion. And um, part of the value of that, which we'll talk about today, is that it gives opportunity to, to, um, to really educate people about agriculture and different agricultural practices and um, it has a lot of different components to it that might be fun and um, farmers and ranchers and even agricultural businesses are uh, turning to this more and more to bump up their income and it also helps to combine the essential elements of tourism and agriculture industry. It attracts members of the public to visit agriculture operations. It's designed designed to increase farm income. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it provides recreation, entertainment, or educational experiences to visitors. And it might be referred to as agritourism or agro tourism. Well, it's important we get the spelling right. That's right. We mm-hmm. want to be politically correct. So. <laughs> so so, what are some other examples? Like we're walking with our llamas. Uh, what came to mind when you're saying that is that old movie City Slickers, you know, when they when they take the cattle and move them from one place to another. That's right. And they so that would be nearly die. Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, let's hope, I well, let's hope they don't all end in death. No, but, uh, I when I ever I have seen that film, it's a cute film, but I think, oh my gosh, the liability <laughs> of those people being totally ignorant of everything and riding mm-hmm. horses and chasing cows and All right. So it, so let's do a little bit like what's a, a a a lamer example, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Less dangerous. Right. Well, let me say that when you bring people from the city, particularly, and you bring them to a farm or a ranch, mm-hmm. you are creating great liability. <laughs> First of all, just from the lack of signage, uh, people can end up at somebody else's farm insisting they're in the right place. But anyway, so so we'll talk about that in a minute. But here's some examples of what commonly we think of when we think about agritourism. Um, one would be pumpkin patches. There's a really popular in the fall. Like sitting around waiting for the great pumpkin or? Well, I suppose that could be one of the things uh-huh. that you could do, but it's mainly that there are lots of pumpkins that the farmer has grown and people go out like like a tree farm, uh, oh, a, a Christmas it. tree, and they're picking them and they often have food and they might have a corn maze. Oh, we went to those like in England where you could go and look at their pigs and they had little Right. Well, that was a farmer's market. Yeah. Like yeah. That. But a, like a corn maze, I guess, is another one of those examples. Right. I just said that. Uh, I think I got ahead of you. You're reading it. Okay. uh, (laughs) No, no, I said like, and then they might have a corn maze. And if I didn't say it, I was thinking it. (laughs) And then uh, you pick operations. So maybe it's strawberries, blueberries, raspberries. You go onto that farm and they point you in the right direction and you go pick. Um, Petting and feeding zoos. So a lot of times people will uh, have young goats or pygmy goats or sheep or in the spring. 
uh, babies, mm -hmm. and they will have uh, petting arrangements. Um, I personally think that's uh, anti-animal welfare because you wouldn't ha allow people to do that to your human baby, and people bring all kinds of germs. And mm -hmm. Anyway, that's a whole different issue, liability. Hay rides. Hay rides, got you. So, uh, Maybe and, like some farm stays. You know, it's not really truly a bed and breakfast, but it's more like you're going to experience the farm. Well, if you came to do chores and do things like that, but if you're just coming there like an Airbnb or something, that wouldn't qualify, I not think, as agritourism. Right. There'd have to be a, something with it. So, as I said, cutting your own Christmas tree, dude ranches, well, so that might be mm -hmm. an example. But that, if you were at a dude ranch, you'd have horses and you'd be grooming horses and, you know, you'd do a lot of different activities. Um Agriculture museums, demonstration farms. So that's a lot of what we are as a demonstration farm, where we're demonstrating different sustainable practices, and people come there for different reasons to learn different things and demonstrate different things. Mm -hmm. Um, living history farms. So okay. that's okay. very popular. So we got the idea. So what? Did, what is? Well, wait. This is the one oh, that's super this is popular. The one. Okay. This What's is that? the one that's popular. Winery uh, tours and wine tasting. Yeah. I see this all the time where people. I don't think of a wine, a wine, uh, a vineyard as being a farm, but I guess the USDA qualifies as that. So what or, could go wrong driving from one place to another to drink? That's or, that's or going to one place and drinking and going somewhere <laughs> else to go home. Right. But anyway, I think it's very popular. There are a lot of uh, tours, bus tours, where people get on a 55-passenger bus and go from one winery to the next uh, mm -hmm. to to have uh, some sips. Okay, so now that you've defined my idea of hell, um, what is the importance? <laughs> I think any of these are close <laughs> Just, to our I, idea. Not, you know, getting, getting on a 55-passenger <laughs> oh, bus with other people who have yeah. been drinking sounds fun. But, you know, I'm uh, in the list it says rural bed and breakfast. Uh, there you go. But okay. I don't think – I think it has to have other activities associated with it because anybody okay. could have a rural bed and breakfast um, and then also something that's quite popular that uh, often see see as a fundraisers are garden tours. Mm -hmm. People love to go and see oh, yeah, England, all kinds of gardens, um, whether it's a you know CSA or it's something with mm -hmm. flowers or whatever. So okay, so so the importance of all of this is you're not making it growing pumpkins, but you're going to make your money bringing people out, selling them other you know, knickknacks and things associated with pumpkins. So so how do you get started in all of this? I mean, what's what's your what's your process? Well, let me say there are a couple of ad other advantages that we didn't uh, acknowledge. And one is that by creating more revenue with these kinds of uh, activities, you're creating uh, more local tax. So for instance, they like that heads on bed tax. So if mm -hmm. you're you have people staying with you, then you get taxed uh, if it's over a certain number of beds. So from a macroeconomic standpoint, bringing people to your farm is more advantageous than you just selling a commodity and shipping it off Yes, somewhere. that's correct, because people mm -hmm. also are going to buy gasoline and groceries and maybe firewood. Cigarettes and lottery tickets. Yeah, there and, you go. Yeah, and they might <laughs> even uh, go to other museums. I mean, that that's... Um, Mm -hmm. in any other activities in the area in fact if you had a were thinking of doing an agritourism business you would want to acknowledge and um, learn more about what things there are to do in your community so that when somebody wants to visit you or or utilize your farm tour or your bed and breakfast they could say well there are other things I could do while I'm there sure to make a weekend of it yes and the other thing it can do is to offer more uh, new employment opportunities so for instance, in the fall, there it's a seasonal job, or maybe it would be a full-time job helping do different things on the farm or managing the bed and breakfast or whatever. So the first thing that you're going to need to do if you really are interested in agritourism is you're going to want to uh, assess what kinds of resources that you currently have. So what kinds of equipment, what kinds of activities do you do or could you do on your property, and what kind of knowledge do you have that would complement tourism. So a good example would be the llama trekking. So we did, uh, we, we talked a lot about um, leadership because with a llama, 
you have to be the boss. You have to be in charge or the llama doesn't trust you. So we liked working particularly with girls and Girl Scouts. They would come and they would start out very timidly because it's a big animal. And um, and they had to create a boldness of themselves. And it happened pretty quickly. And they really loved it and enjoyed it. And then we did a lot of things with local food and healthy food because we had a, pic- a little picnic in the woods. to, um, And then they would come back and have... Uh, high tea with us. And so they learned a lot about um, conservation. And these were all things that people wouldn't have chosen to come and do at a sustainable living farm, but they did it because the exoticness of, if that's a word, of of the llamas and the connection uh, with the llamas. And then the other thing that we did with the llamas is we sold uh, the wool when we would uh, harvest the wool from them, and we had little kits of how to make felted wool. And then we also sold something called llama poo uh, pellets <laughs> that were in a cute little package, and it said nothing but the best. Yeah, a uh, picture of the llama saying our factory. And, yes, and uh, mm-hmm. or sometimes well, when we ran out, we would say, uh, we're we're uh, we're running behind <laughs> and things like that, but but it made a tea and sure. it was a great way to educate about gardening. And it gardening. is a fertilizer, not a drinking. Tea. Oh yeah, and it said that not for mm-hmm. human consumption, but it made about it was a little quart package and it made um, uh, many gallons, fifty gallons, and people loved it. And so it was a great way to talk about conservation. In fact, we used to sell enough poo to pay for our feed bill for the year. So again, these were. First of all, the llama trekking, and then we built on that with other kinds of ways to do it. I think it points out that just because you decide, okay, I want to have a pumpkin patch or I want to have a corn maze, this is entertainment, it's show business, it's marketing, it's all of these things. So if, if you don't have those qualities, if you don't have those assets within yourself or there's something unique about your property or something, you know, think long and hard because, you know, people... People have certain expectations if they're going to fork over the money. But every property has potential. Every single property. Maybe you need somebody like us to look at it and help you figure it out. Mm -hmm. But uh, everybody's got something going that could really be fun or interesting, even if it's something where people would come and draw Uh, do you know certain times you would open up and you'd have maybe tea and crumpets and people would bring their sketch pads and or you'd have a wild food walk or uh you know some kind of bonfire sleepover or drumming i mean you can create opportunities because you have an environment that's rural and once again it is an event but the internet really help small businesses to reach that market. I mean, you become Absolutely. your customer base is now global yeah. instead of just sticking ad. a sign yeah. out next to the interstate and hoping right. people are going to come to your pumpkin patch. Right. Well, and that is that's a good point and also the point about signage because um, people from town expect to be widely directed. And especially with you. That's a nice way of saying they're pretty much helpless. Well, a lot of times and also (laughs) because you can't always depend on the Internet uh, and and uh, map quest kinds of things. And people get lost easily and then they can't find their way because they don't have access to um, to high speed broadband. Okay, and before we talk a little bit about how people freak out when they lose their cell signal, (laughs) I want to remind you that you are listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. And we want to remind you, once again, it is indeed the end of the world as we know it. And thank God. Thank God. So we're changing the world. We're, We're creating our own corn maze. No, we're not doing corn mazes. I, I, I don't want to do anything like that. But I do uh-huh. think that this is a valuable activity. I think if we had, if we came from the perspective of this is a great way to help people to try to connect better with the soil and the land and critters and really took it from that standpoint, um, I think we can make some big changes, well, especially I, with kids. I think we're, we're seeing that. I mean, we see this a lot with people who come to Blue Rock Station. People are disconnected from the world they live in. They, there's this sense of ennui or disconnect. And, Wait, um, what's ennui? Ennui. It's, oh, that, la la. it's that sad little feeling that you're disconnected from everything. Uh, okay. A perceptible sadness. I'll define it that way. And I'll define I it wrong. I had no idea. You know so much I, about I, French. I, I went to Ohio University. So <laughs> anyway, um, so, so uh, there is this disconnect. 
And uh, this helps people maybe connect a little bit locally. I mean, there there can be a hundred thousands of these things. Of these oh, there little, probably is. Yeah, and within easy driving distance. So now mm-hmm. you just need to search them out and, and help your local economy. Yeah, I think that's true. But the other thing is, it's not so easy just to say, okay, I want to do a llama trek or a corn maze or a pumpkin patch because the government has a lot to say about these things in mm-hmm. terms of liability. As always. Yeah, well, but but the part of the role of government is to provide safety for people, and it's done a poor job of it and, in the past. And so. to harsh my mellow, baby. Okay, so. <laughs> baby. So anyway, so there are some, first of all, I would say if you really want to do this, you should put together what your assets are, maybe bring in somebody to help you kind of uh, massage a little bit what you're thinking and how it might work and a little bit about the marketing of it, like you mentioned. But then the next piece would be what are the local zoning requirements? What's the health department got to say about a number of issues? One is how you maybe have animals, how you treat the waste, how mm-hmm. you treat, how are, what are people going to do when they come there to use the toilet or yeah, not use the toilet? Waste yes, that's right. Animal waste, human waste. Um, and also, if you're going to serve food, uh, there are rules around food service. And do not bring up anything <laughs> about food service because I don't want the health department <laughs> calling me up and saying I did something wrong. Uh-huh. But anyway, I'm saying there are a lot of rules in every municipality, every district, every state, every township has some rules. And if and you, some of them make sense. And if you <laughs> want to break the rules, you have to know what well, they are okay. first. No, so, we don't recommend you breaking no, the rules. No, we're not telling you to do it, but I'm just saying if you decide to do it, you should at least know what you're breaking. <laughs> so if they come calling, you know what to do about it. Um, I would say in defense of the small business person that it's very important to know what these rules are and to do your best to comply because most of the people who are working in these different segments of the government do want you to do well because it reflects well on them. And so, but I do recommend that if you have to have inspections um, at the beginning, that everything is written out exactly what they're going to inspect and what they're allowed to do and where they're allowed to go so that you don't end up having all these other parts of your life disrupted because they see something they don't like and it has nothing to do with why you've asked them to be there. So this, to me, has been very good advice that... um, I've used a lot in our business. Right. It's always good to – and maybe your first step would be to go down to your local health department or your business uh, regulatory department and and just say, hey, I'm thinking about this. What do I need to consider? And Mm -hmm. I know, for instance, our thing was, uh, you know, around commercial kitchens and they – they're saying as long as you're serving, you know, prepackaged food because the food was not the big deal for us or if you're limiting it to a certain number – a year, then you don't fall within those restrictions. Mm-hmm. So you just need to know what that is. So well, you it's so many yourself. meals a week. But yeah. here is the problem is they required three sinks, and the third one had to have chlorine bleach in it, which we would never do in a five trillion years mm-hmm. of business. Well, I promised I wasn't going to get into this, but I'll have No, no, no. But that, but so we, so, <laughs> All right, there you go. but we don't fall under their, their rules because we don't serve enough gotcha. meals. Mm-hmm. And we are totally legal, but we had to be able, the one thing, <laughs> That we had to do in order to be legal, because you have to know the rules, is we needed a little sign that said we were not required to Mm -hmm. uh, comply. We weren't required to have a license under Ohio Revised Code. The reason I say that is because if we hadn't had that sign, we could have been fine. So this gets into the thing of we had to post a sign that we were not, did not fall under the rule that the sign said we didn't fall under, but if we didn't post the sign, then we'd we be were in, in trouble. trouble for the rule that didn't right. apply to us. That's and, right. All right, there you go. But this is fine to talk about this part. <laughs> it's all the other parts I don't want you to go into. Uh-huh. Anyway, so then also your neighbors, because I'll give an example. Um, in our situation where we live in the middle of nowhere and down in the holler, somebody decided they were going to have mud running and they would play music at a decibel that would be deafening even where we were. And um, we used to really be upset about it, but there was nothing we All could right. do. And then somebody had an accident, mm-hmm. and now they're not doing it anymore. So that brings up liability issues. 
So Well, all right, but wait, because it's really important to go. <laughs> okay, I'm going to keep you on task here. I'm on task. <laughs> Neighbors, what do uh-huh. they? What would they think of what you're going to do? Would they be a good asset and help you promote what you're doing? Would they maybe have a field where people could park if you were having a big event? Um, also, p- places you do business locally, letting them know, but also asking them what they think and would they be prepared to handle For example, we have a little gas station that's two miles before you come up the hill to our farm. Could could we call you ahead of time and let you know a big bus is coming so everybody could exit the bus and use the toilet facilities because people freak out at composting toilets? Right, and in exchange, they're going to buy... Can't they sell? They they are always prepared. We let them know ahead of time because they buy every candy bar. It's so bizarre. Right. Anyway, say la vie. So and then also your own toilets. What you're going to need to do. So in the beginning, we we rented a toilet. Uh, until we could figure out what our exact needs were, and so there are definite requirements for that. And also, what what kind of mobility will people have that are visiting you? That if they can use the what you have available, or if you have to modify it, and all that falls back on government rules. Mm-hmm. So it's very important to know what those rules are. And these rules apply typically, regardless of what business you're getting into. That just that they also apply to agribusiness. Right. And there's lots and lots of things online. And again, it's not one size fits all because every district, every township, every state has different requirements and different things they look at and and they they change over time. And we do that just to make it easy. Right. But you can (laughs) go online and look up your state's uh, revised code, it's called. So Iowa revised code or California revised code. And you can look up these different topics and you can see what is required. Well, one of the issues, bringing us back to the liability issue, because I want to focus on that a little bit. Um, That was a big deal when we were trying to do the, the llama trekking because no insurance company seemed prepared to um, ensure against the tremendous risks involved in walking with a llama, you know, which is um, bizarre since they're fairly gentle creatures. Well, it's lack of knowledge. But but the other thing, they worry about dogs. So we had dogs and uh, anybody who keep a dog that's going to bite, well, that's, you know, crazy. But I think, again, is looking at everything as if you are – If you are the visitor, so maybe you have some old equipment around that if kids got away and they were climbing on it, they would be injured. So it isn't just about animals, but definitely that's that's a a big. Well, you were telling me that some of the laws have changed where there's an assumption of risk. There's an assumption of, you know, I don't know, realistic risks like you're expected to be able to walk from a parking lot to to a building, um, you know, unless there's some unusual hazard um, that that the in, there is an assumption that life carries inherent risks. Is that not the case? Uh, well, I guess that's who's interpreting it. But I, th- but there are <laughs> once some, the lawyers get involved, that's right. Then the litigation the doesn't matter. There's well, that's money. and that's what liability insurance really is. It's insurance to pay for the lawyers. Well, that's true because they're the ones that are going to get all of it if whoever whomever wins. But the the other piece of this is that there are some states who recognize in the favor of the farm farmer ranch that there is a certain amount of this going to happen liability, and they don't hold them responsible. So it's not a matter of do you have liability insurance. It's a matter of it's not a liability. Yeah, a good example might be when people come out to the country. They might get stung by a bee. You know, right, well, it's not the mm-hmm. farm owner's problem unless they happen to be keeping beehives in the middle of their parking lot. Then obviously there's some some dumb thing they did that increased the risk. But if it's just nature being nature. I'm not sure if that's true either. I, no. I think that the laws, as I have seen them, seem very loosey-goosey in their explanation of what that means. So my guess is it would come down to litigation and what the courts have to say about it. And I don't think anybody has forced that just yet. But anyway, online you can go. There's a, a, a site called Agritourism Reading Room. And you can go there and read all about agritourism and what's involved. So, so let's talk about 
animal welfare. Okay, let's. Because I mentioned that briefly. Um, The law says that animals used strictly for agricultural purposes are exempt from regulation under the Animal Welfare Act, AWA it's called. And it is ap- the, the AWA is applicable when animals are exhibited, even if the animals are farm animals. And um, so, so basically you're saying that you can be cruel to your animal as long as it's producing food? I believe that's true. And I remember once at the state fair, they had uh, these incredible milk cows that were lined up in a portable pen. Each one had its own pen. And they were standing in the middle of it, and they were in labor. I, I actually thought I was going to get hysterical, and they're going to birth right there. And I just said to the, to the vet that was standing there, the veterinarian, how is this, you know, animal welfare? And they said, oh, this man that's farmer that puts these cows here, he's done this every year for 20 years because he wants people to understand what a milk cow uh, does in its life, and and then they took the calves as soon as they're born away, and I was like, "How is this animal welfare?" But it's because mm-hmm. it's an exhibit, and so they're exempt from the rules. Okay. So if you want to use animals in agritourism, apparently you're exempt from animal really? welfare. I didn't laws. think agritourism was actually considered agriculture. Well, there's a farm there, okay. or a rancher, else you wouldn't be doing well, that. Well, whether you're exempt or not, don't be cruel to your animals. Be nice to them. Well, I think one thing it does talk about in some of the literature is that an agritourism operator who uses animals for exhibition purposes should be aware of the fact that they might need to apply in some way to the American um, uh, the Animal Welfare Act, uh, whatever that is, to see yeah. what's involved so they don't put themselves in a litigation. Well, I'm hoping that people will just behave kindly anyway. Okay, well then that's your first problem. <laughs> that's why I'm not a farmer. That is so true. <laughs> you also have no empathy for the poor critters, uh-huh. but you wouldn't be mean on purpose. Right. You just yell at them and say they're sociopaths. Well, they are. <laughs> just the goats. Just the goats. No, you say uh-huh. that about the cats too. Yeah. So Okay, well, cats and goats, I don't know. They're, they're in league with each other. So. No, no. All right. Well, not. you've got 30 seconds. Um, okay. You know. So let's just say that if you want to go into agritourism, first of all, you better like people a lot because they can be very uh, uh, silly. Uh, annoying. Uh, annoying. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say ignorant. But um, – and and so good customer service. And there are – you can take a class on customer service uh, just to see – and you can do marketing. But you've got to have a lot of skill sets to do this. Fortunately, the internet's there and it, people are looking all the time for things to do. And so it's a great way to add income to your farm and also educate about life uh, in agriculture. But it's not necessarily an easy way. No, there's nothing easy about it. Okay, well, you have been listening to When the Biomass Hits the Wind Turbine with Jay and Annie Warmke. We want to thank our Emmy-winning producer, Adam Rich, in their eating apple cobbler. And thank you for spending just a little bit of time with us. And as your grandmother probably told you, the secret to a happy and sustainable life is... Play nice with others, Jay. Clean up your own mess. And don't go into customer service related work. <laughs> okay. Till next time. Bye bye. Mother Earth will sing and her children will be healed. See the Lord in glory, blossom in the night. Know the skies are sing. You can find more information on living sustainably in our unsustainable world at blueRockStation.com. Yeah.